second license. What's your oldest vine? Uh, they were planted in 1984, the Gamay Noir and the Muscat Autumn. Do you make a Gamay Noir uh, single vineyard? Um, we do in some vintages. <laughs> in fact, uh, <laughs> last year we made a Gamay Noir ice wine. So maybe be Gamay Glacé or something, but it's yummy. It's a beautiful ice wine. Okay. Now, um, so this pour, we have, we have a huge portfolio of uh, uh, we decided to bring our 2014 Merlot and our 2016 Alo Pinot Green. Tell me about uh, the Alo Pinot Green and why is it Alo? So, um, Hillside has always done a Pinot Gris, which we called our Reserve Pinot Gris. And in 2008, we split the portfolio and um, started producing the Unowned Pinot Gris, that's 100% stainless steel fermentation. The Reserve Pinot Gris has some barrel fermentation and um, is a, a different style, um, much more tropical, much of a uh, more of a food style wine. Whereas the animal tree has beautiful, bright, fresh tree orchard fruits and um, lends itself really well to being that, that bright uh, stainless steel style. Do you prefer it on oak to oak? Oh, it depends on the occasion, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the food that I'm carrying it with. Does it, does it then, take that thinking forward, would an oaked uh, Pinot Gris be more conducive to pairing with something and an unoaked perhaps just as a patio wine? Uh, the, the oaked is more, the reserve is more of a food wine and, it, and it's sort of the, um, you know, a Chardonnay lover's Pinot Gris. You know, it's very much that big, punctual style that, that you get in some Chardonnays. So then who likes the unoaked? Oh, patio sitters. Many, many of them. <laughs> It's our it's our top selling wine. Uh, we sell out every year. It's a struggle for me to get it in the bottle in time. How many year. cases? Um, we're up to twenty five hundred cases this year. It's on allocation already. It'll sell out. And the price point? Twenty dollars at the winery. Well, uh, now. <laughs> so, I, I'm kind of wondering: is this was it? Is it the unoaked? Is it the response to what you heard in your tasting room, or did you? sort of put your nose in the air and, and figure out that that's what people were heading towards, that no, was a trend? No, not at all. It was a response to the fruit. Um, when we started sourcing um, a specific vineyard from the Naramata Bench with these just really bright, beautiful, white peach, green apple flavors, I said, there's no way we can put this in oak. We'll just lose that. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll swamp it. We need to bring forth that bright core of fruit. And, and, you know, it just turned out to be a yummy wine that people responded to. And so, you know, we make more and more every year. And um, we source all of our fruit from the Naramata Bench. So, and we've made a strong commitment to that. I don't bring in fruit from any other areas. So it's, it's uh, a challenge to get enough Pinot Gris and also of the styles that I'm looking for for this wine. But it also makes it a lot more fun as a winemaker to be able to um, send, you know, to judge the fruit and, and send it to one stream or the other, either to, to the uh, barrel program or the stainless. Kevin Malone is the winemaker uh, and the, one of the team leaders at Hillside on the Naramad Adventure. It's there for in Victoria. And we have discovered, I think, one of our first fine patio wines of the summer of 2017. The Unoaked Pinot Gris 2016 from Hillside, 13.7. Uh, alcohol, let's be getting up there, and um, but well, 13 seconds on a hot day. I'm just saying, if you if you drank the whole bottle, you'd be one of the best. No, um, I wouldn't. I'm a winemaker. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm a seasoned professional. professional. <laughs> Never mind. A bench uh, has left the bench. The Winery Association is on tour. They go to Vancouver, but first they come to Victoria, and we found them at the uh, Conference Center, 720 Douglas Street. Next up, one of the best winemakers and one of the best interviews anywhere in this business, Jeff Martin. Jeff and Neva, by the way, Neva's over there pouring while Jeff's over talking. She's right. From La Friends, yeah, no, <laughs> from La Friends Winery uh, on the Naramata Bench, one of the first wineries that you see as you head down that road. Hello, Jeff. How was the year? How are your releases? Give us an update. Yeah, with the two wines I've chosen tonight. Uh, or today, uh, the 2016 
uh, Sauvignon Blanc and the 2015 Pinot Noir. They're both new spring releases that were currently just released. Can I just uh, ask you on the side, I have one of your Tempranillos yep. from a couple of years ago. Uh, Probably five years ago, yes. About five years ago? Yep. So how long can it sit in my cellar? Uh, up to 10 years. Tempranillo is typically, it's a, it's a lighter, savory wine, and uh, but that wine's got enough acidity and structure. It'll develop beautifully in bottle for up to 10 years. Did you do a cab as well? We do a cab set, yes. Okay, so off, off. I've got one of those as well. Yes, yes. Uh, great wine. Yeah, yeah, it's structured, beautiful wine. Uh, do I get the sense that you have a, a, a short shelf life for wines that don't work for you after you've made them and they come out and you go, nah, I'll try something else? Uh, no. Um, over the years, like we've been going 18 years, but over the years, uh, when we first started out, we were a virtual winery. You know, I, I contracted my fruit. And, uh, but now we're 80% estate grown, so um, vineyards that don't suit what I'm doing. We're virtually, uh, we have four different vineyard sites over 42 acres, so we're pretty much 80% estate grown, and over the 18 years we've moved in that direction. That's that's what that's all about. All right, I see your Sauvignon Blanc is on the table. Um, tell us about that. Okay, it's our 2016 Sauvignon Blanc, uh, about to be released in the next few weeks. Uh, I think one of the most the last five vintages of that Sauvignon Blanc has never been below a gold medal in any competition. It's had platinum awards, uh, passion fruit, uh, asparagus. It's very vegetative in the New Zealand style, but more body than they can be a little linear in body. Uh, so I think this wine, we, considering we're expecting a really warm year, which detracts from that flavour, um, I think we absolutely nailed it. And uh, It's beautiful. That's good. Yes, I think it's got medals written all over it. Uh, how many cases? 1,100 cases. Okay, like that. Price yep. point? Uh, $22, which is a steal. Couldn't bring it under 20 uh, Typically, no. Not, not. It's worth every penny. I, I, like I said, well, you I were think talking about the millennials out there. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, I think it's one of the uh, most awarded uh, Sauvignon Blancs in North America, and they start at $30, $40, $50. $50. And then we come to just a joy to announce. It's the La Friends Nermat Bench Pinot Noir from Desperation Hill. And, yes. and when we were up there and you had set up a table and we were, you were talking to us and telling us about the plantings, yes. and then I think there was some food up there as well, how old were those vines then? That was about five years ago. We'd, our 08 reserve, not from that vineyard, had, had just won a major competition as the best Pinot in the Northwest back in 2011. So we're talking five, six years ago. So that vineyard now, this is our 2015, just released. This is our, not our reserve Pinot, but look at the colour of that. It's, it's massive. And uh, it's off the same Desperation Hill vineyard. And what we're so happy... That's $24, which I think is an absolutely bargain oh, price. Oh, now you're talking. Yes, that's a seriously good Pinot. The density, the way we farm it, the way we uh, farm the soil. We have to have a living soil, biodiversity, and that flavor of the earth shows in a Pinot. And that's our second tier Pinot. How many, uh, how many cases? Uh, 800 on that one. Okay. But our, our reserve Pinot, what's... You know, we've had a Pinot focus on that Desperation Hill vineyard, as you saw five, six years ago when they were younger vines. They're about 10 year old now. Um, we were selected to be uh, in the International Pinot Celebration in Oregon at the end of July with the Reserve Pinot and this one. And um, 150 producers from around the world submit samples to be selected for that, for that tasting. And um, our reserve, this is the first time we've done it, and uh, we're in the top 36 feature wineries. One more thing about the serving of that uh, Pinot Noir. Do you like a chill on it? Uh, I, I looked at that, but Pinot can handle that. Uh, no, it's probably a little cooler. Um, but, you know, we came down overnight, and it was in, but it was in the underground parking at the thing. But it is a little cool, and that typically tightens it up. But um, we've had them outside, so we've had them out tonight. But uh, I think that wine will still show... Uh, Still show incredibly well, even though it's probably cooler than it should be. I made a couple of notes here. Uh, number your winery, not, not not that I'm telling you anything you don't know, mm -hmm. is uh, number six in BC, number eleven in Canada, two uh, gold. Uh, no, is this a wine? Hold on a second. Five silver. Did you win five silver? I think we did. Yeah, that was probably wine aligned, but uh, we only went in two competitions. But um, you can be from the top three to number ten. And was your 2008 uh, Reserve Pinot Noir number one in the Pacific Northwest? Yes, it was. Is there any left? 
Uh, no, it would have sold out about five years well, ago. Well, I'm just wondering about that. Maybe you stuck to No, I think that Desperation Hill Pinot, with the age of the vine and what we're trying to do, um, is, is showing beautifully at the moment. The concentration in that fruit and deficit irrigation, getting absolutely intense uh, concentration in Pinot. Look at that for Pinot Noir colour. That's some people's Syrah. Now I have to go home and figure out what, what was the irrigation? Def oh, sorry. Deficit, deficit, deficit irrigation. irrigation. Deficit irrigation. No, you don't have to tell us. No, you, no, you don't. No. You have to create small, <laughs> concentrated berries. And you know how last year we had a we had a very uh, wet second half. Everyone was complaining about the water. There were some blocks last year in in the Okanagan on on, a, on the Narramatta bench. There was a number of different blocks that I did use zero irrigation through the year because it didn't need it. And uh, we typically make the soil as dry as can be. We were just in Australia and looking at, say, Molly Duca, which is a leader in that in irrigation control. And uh, I went around with the owner of Molly, du Molly Duca. We're Sparky? Doing Sp Sparky, yes. Yeah. He's doing exactly, or we're doing exactly as he's doing. And, uh, you know, in Australia, in that climate, uh, irrigation control is critical. People that say... Well, like Burgundians, they say you, c you shouldn't need to use irrigation, but it rains every day over there. You know, they can't turn the water off. We can control the water. So manage it and you can get all the concentration and power you want. All right, last question. Uh, any surprises uh, from the portfolio this year? Anything that you haven't announced that you want to tell us about now? Um, not really. I think, I mean... New blends, new... Well, only the Levita Part Series is a wine... Um, is a, it's a, it's for for younger people. It's got a very. It's my wife Neva is uh, from Northern Italy, uh, Australian born, but her parents moved there in 1950. Um, I think there's some really interesting wines because um, the price points under $22, 22 for the red, uh, 19 for the white, and they're really savoury, interesting wines. They're not cheap and cheerful at that price price point. They're really savoury and interesting, and uh, so I th as blends. You know, blends should you shouldn't blend down. You should blend up. Did uh, Neva teach you the website? <laughs> the website. Do you know the web What's the address? What's the website address? Oh, oh yes. Sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, speak English. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, lafriendswinery.com. Thank you. Uh, so the much awarded and highly sought after the Friends Winery, Jeff and Neva Martin, pouring here in Victoria for the Narramatta Bench Wineries Association. Uh, this is um, this is Garen Ells, by the way. He, uh, for 21 years, has been the winemaker at Lake Breeze, which is about 20 years longer than any one of these other people have stayed in one place for one time. Exactly. How did it work out? Why, how, how are you still at Lake Breeze? I mean, the, the whole thing about winemakers, they, when they're young, they sleep around. <laughs> but but they, they move around trying to get, I don't know what, I don't know what they're looking for. You, st you stayed at Lake Breeze, why? Uh, blind luck. I mean, the, the, the plan initially was uh, three or four years. I came over from South Africa and I was just going to do three or four years and, and then go back. Um, and then, I mean, you've been to Naramata. I, I ended up in Naramata and there's worse places in the world to live. So I, I just never left. And, and I've, I've had good owners for 21 years. and. And, uh, you know, they've looked after me and I've looked after them and it just kind of a match made in heaven. The training that you had at that point when you showed up in Naramata, did it serve you well with that new terroir, the new, new set? Uh, interesting question. I mean, the basic, the basic training always serves you well, but uh, when I showed up in a cool climate, like I had absolutely no idea what I was getting into. Um, I remember my first vintage picking a Chardonnay at 24 bricks with an acid of 12 grams per liter. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, so yeah, it was a pretty steep learning curve, but, uh, yeah, when you have to learn, you learn pretty quickly. You do. You learn well. Uh, the, I love the awards, uh, for Lake Breeze, small winery of the year, 10,000 cases. That's what they make. Small wine of the year at ten thousand. Uh, highest rate? Uh, yeah, we we had a pretty good year. Um, winning winning small winery of the year and best winery in BC was obviously uh, fantastic. Um, you you also have to take some of these awards with a with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, there's a lot of good wineries and a lot of good wines that are entered into a lot of these competitions, and uh, um, you know sometimes you kind of get the rub of the green. 
but it's uh, it, it's always nice. And the wines that we did win for in that particular competition were all fantastic wines that turned out really, really well. So you, I see you brought a uh, the spice jar. Tell me about the spice jar. No, not to the table, but to, to yeah. pour. Uh, spice bar, spice jar is a, uh, a wine that we started uh, probably, I think, three years ago. Um, we have one grower that grows incredibly good Gewürztraminer. Um, and we used to make a varietal Gewürztraminer, but we, we, we didn't want to do it anymore because we just felt like there's a lot of Gewürztraminer in the valley and a lot of people making varietal Gewürztraminer. Um, but we still wanted to utilize this fruit that this guy grows for us in, in Naramata. So we decided to come up with the most uh, aromatic, uh, perfumey blend that we possibly could. So um, it's a Gewürztraminer based blend, but it has all the aromatic varieties that you can think of. Uh, Ehrenfelser, Moria Muscat, uh, Viognier, Schonberger. So anything and everything that we grow that is uh, aromatic and perfumey uh, goes into that blend. Uh, Garen, tell me about the uh, 2014 Nerotage. Uh, 2014 Meritage. Uh, Meritage is something that we, uh, we've we been doing for a long time. Uh, the price point on our Meritage is, is very, very good. Uh, it's a wine that sells for uh, $20. And it, we think it's it's the best value for money Meritage out there. The marketing people would say it's approachable. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, designed to be, it's designed to be drunk young. It, it's a... Uh, uh, it's an early drinking wine. Uh, it's pretty much always Merlot driven. Uh, and we have a little bit of Cab Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon and Malbec in there. So we've so we got four of the five varieties. Now, the, the, now, okay, so what we're talking, if you're just joining us now, this is Garen Elms, 21 years now, the winemaker at Lake Breeze. But the two you want to talk about today here in Victoria are the Lake Breeze uh, Sablanc Blanc and the Lake Breeze Pinot Blanc. Absolutely. Uh, let's start with the uh, Sablanc Blanc for a second. So yeah, the Sauv Blanc is the uh, 2016. Um, Sauv Blanc has always been one of, well, probably my favorite white variety. Um, my favorite red being being Merlot. Um, the the Sauv Blanc that we make in uh, the fruit that comes from Naramata is, we always seem to get a, a great balance between uh, those green flavors that are so typical of, of Sauv Blanc and the tropical. Uh, so it's not too tropical and it's not too green. Um, so it's a wine that we we you know, consistently love every single year. Uh, how many cases did you make? Uh, Sauvignon Blanc is around 800 cases a year. So price point? Uh, Sauvignon Blanc, nineteen dollars. No, sorry, I lie. Uh, Twenty-one dollars. Couldn't keep it under twenty. <laughs> no. Well, it, it's about the fruit, right? If there's if there's not a lot of fruit. We do buy a lot of our fruit, um, so if there's not a lot of fruit out there, you end up having to pay more for the fruit, especially the good stuff. We're talking Lake Breeze with Garen Elms. Uh, we come now to, I think, one of the real uh, prouder moments uh, for the man. It's the Pinot Blanc. Now, Pinot Blanc is um, can um, was once predicted to be the white wine uh, in the Okanagan. It didn't turn out that way, but it's very close. But this, you call this a classic. This is labeled as a classic wine. Why is it? Well, for us, we we started 21 years ago, pretty much with Pinot Blanc. Uh, that was the first wine that we made, and it was the first wine that we ever got any recognition for. And from my perspective, uh, any Pinot Blanc that I'd encountered before I, I got to BC was basically a blending wine. Yeah. Uh, it was just blah. Um, it didn't have a lot of character. It was just very neutral. Um, and then when I got to Lake Breeze and we have this block that's now almost 35 years old um, and planted on what's almost uh, almost 100% sand, um, it just, it, it creates, uh, it, it gives us so much complexity. So I, I always, I refer to it as fruit salad. Um, <laughs> there, there's so many different, there's so many different fruits, uh, flavors and aromas in there that it, it's hard to actually pinpoint. Uh, even just one or two of them. Um, but one of the main reasons I, I wanted to taste that today is uh, that's the 2015. So it's getting to a point where it's almost been in the bottle for a year. Um, and a lot of Pinot Blancs have always been, uh, they've been marketed as early drinking wines, you know, kind of bottle them and drink them yeah. right away. Um, so a lot of people actually don't keep them for a year, year and a half. And around about that time, they just start to develop this great 
uh, viscosity and texture on the palate. Do you know how and hard it is to hold on to a Pinot Blanc in the summer? Well, buy a case. <laughs> 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 no, drink drink six and keep the rest. Because, hide them. Have someone yeah, hide the other six. It, it really does make a difference. If you can hold on to them for a year and actually give them that time in the bottle to develop that, um, it, it makes a huge difference to uh, you know to the whole experience of drinking it. Okay, Garen, Garen uh, one final question. That is, um, any surprises this year? Anything under the table? Anything that you haven't told us about that's coming? Um, in terms of in, in terms of uh, the Lake Breeze brand, probably not that much. Um, I don't know uh, if you or any of your listeners have have uh, heard of our, our new project, which is uh, kind of a a super premium focus on Merlot and Chardonnay, um, which is called the uh, McIntyre Heritage Reserve. Um, and we've we've really kind of put our money where our mouth is in terms of uh, specifically Chardonnay and Merlot that we grow ourselves on the property. Um, very limited release wines uh, that are only available through mailing list and, and restaurants. And and we've uh, you know we've we've put them up against some of the best in the world recently, and and been incredibly pleased with the results and very happy with it. So that's kind of our next project is trying to push the envelope in terms of quality with the stuff that we grow ourselves. Have yourself a great year. Thanks. Thank you for the wines. No problem. Hold on a second. Go away. Go away. Go away. I, just, I need something to drink. Association are pouring here as part of their spring release tour. It gets them out of Naramata. The streets become safer and quieter. Uh, and they all gather here in Victoria and they usually tear up a pub somewhere and then go off and the night. Uh, leading that charge is Will Hardman, uh, winemaker, and Brian Hardman, the owner of Deep Roots Winery. And he's brought, uh, he's going to be a mall there, we'll talk about it in a second. It's the Gamay and the Chardonnay. Will, how are you? How's your dad? I'm How's good, thank fruits? you. I'm good, thank you. Yeah, we're good. We're ready to be open again for the season, which is nice. It's been a long winter of being sold out, so uh, it's good to have everything bottled, and spring release is always a fun time. What's total production? We're up to 3,000 cases now. So, and what sold out first? What sold out last? Ah, we sold out of our Syrah really quick. We won uh, Best Red Wine in Canada with it. Uh, so that flew off the shelf. Um, quickly behind that was our Gamay and our White Blend Parentage and our Chardonnay. They all sold out kind of bang, 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 all kind of end of the summer. Did you happen to bring that Syrah with you today? You know what? We just bottled it, so it's not quite ready. So. Did you happen to bring the... Uh, did you happen to bring the Malbec with you? We did bring some Malbec, and it's still a little young, but uh, we brought it for the trade. And a little tightly wound, is it? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So it still needs to open up a little bit, and uh, we'll get there. Another month or so. All right, so you brought a red and a white. Let's start with the white. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, tell them where the hell Deep Roots is. Right, so um, right on the bench. We've been there 100 years, our family. So I'm fourth generation on the property. Um, we're, we're right kind of smack dab in between Lake Breeze and Elephant Island on Aiken's Loop, so we kind of got a nice thing going with Elfin Island, Van Westen, and Joie. We're all kind of about 400 meters from each other. Have you got vineyards above and below the, the road? We do, so we kind of get some nice terroir mix that way. Uh, we got some of the stony, kind of almost what used to be lake bottom okay. um, up above the road, and then uh, below the road it's all kind of the clay and silt, so it's, it's kind of nice as a winemaker. We kind of get best of both worlds. So that bench, in fact, was underwater and was a sort of a shallow shoreline. Exactly. So the glacier kind of tore up through the valley. Uh, I'm not a geologist, but I, billions I, of years ago. I do know whenever one that thing, was. that the west side of the valley, remnants of it can be found in Merritt. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's famous, right? So, um, so yeah, it's really interesting to kind of work in the valley, right? We a lot, a lot to work with. So lots of different little mini microclimates and what have you. So when you talk about deep roots, you're talking about deep roots in terms of the vines, but also about the family. That's it. So uh, we have upwards of 20 year old vines in some areas. And like I said before, I'm fourth generation. So uh, no family really has been making fruit and growing fruit longer than us on the bench. So. We're pretty proud of that. You can start a war with that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's the way it is. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay, Will, tell me about the white. Okay, so I'm going to start you off with the unoaked Chardonnay. Um, it's got a really nice balance of acid in this. You really get to taste the fruit. Um, not having it oaked kind of brings out a lot of the stone fruit. So you get, kind of get some apple notes, 
Um, yeah, really good backbone Damn. with the acid. Damn, that's good. You know what? There's lots of good Chardonnays coming off the bench, so I like doing the unoaked, so it kind of sets us apart a little bit. Where's that nice honey come from? Yeah, so that, you know what? That's coming from a little bit of malolactic that I put it through. Um, so I'll start it off, kind of bring some of the sweetness forward, also some creaminess. Uh, but again, like I said, the acid really kind of gives it that nice backbone, the, the really kind of heart of the wine, really. Okay, I'm not going to pass this on to anybody else, but <laughs> that's exactly the temperature I want to serve my Chardonnay. Okay, well, good to know. Well, Everybody else was room temp. A little, uh, that's what I want. You know what? I'm, I'm always in and out of the icebox with this thing, kind of testing it with my hand, making sure it's the right temperature. So, uh, How many cases did you make? Of the Chardonnay, we're about 330, 300, just over 300. And what's the price point? It is $22 out of the taste room. That's really good. You know what? It's price to move and it moves quick. Did you did you take some of the uh, Chardonnay and run it through some oak? Uh, no, zero oak. Not, not for that, but I mean, oh. for, do you do an oak? We don't, so that's the next step. We have enough fruit to kind of do two different wines. So that's kind of our, our look for next year's. Uh, maybe I'll do 100 cases of oak, oak Chard as well. <laughs> oh. oh, yummy. 330 cases? That's it, yeah. So uh, last year's version actually won, uh, it was it was the number one uh, best un oak Chardonnay in Canada. Damn, that's good. Uh, what's the, um, what's the uh, alcohol? Alcohol on the Chardonnay is 13 and a half. So on a hot day? On a hot day, you're still... Just kind of perfect. It's still a now, nice wine. In the I may be selling that short by saying that's a patio wine because that's a great food wine. It is. It is. So really good with, um, you know, uh, fish, uh, any, even even a spicy food that you may normally tend to go maybe towards a more floral, sweeter wine. It, it, it's really versatile. Pasta. Okay. Pasta as well. Yeah. Now, tell me what the red is. Okay. So the Gamay, this is kind of our flagship. I got to introduce you. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Deep Roots Winery on the Naramata Bench is pouring for us. This is Tasty Room Radio in Victoria. Terry David Mulligan. Uh, he is Corey Wood. Over there. Uh, so, Will Hardman has poured me the, um, the uh, Chardonnay on oak. Loved it. Now, the Gamay. What's with the Gamay? I love the Gamay. Yeah, so the Gamay, this is what really put us on the map in 2014. Um, no one had really heard of us, and rightly so. It was our first year being open. Our 2014 Gamay kind of blew everyone away uh, at the National Wine Awards. Uh, got all the big writers, Gizmondi, what have you, writing about us. Um, and thanks to all those guys because it really opened our doors to a lot of customers that, again, hadn't heard of us. And the Gamay kind of put us on the map. So um, here's our 2016 vintage. Um, still kind of classic us. It's kind of nice blueberry notes, some violet, um, maybe some dark raspberry in there. Uh, really nice, versatile wine. You can. And my dad likes to chill it uh, in the summer. Um, hey, I want to talk to your dad because I'd chill that. <laughs> yeah, right. I so, would chill that. So I'm, I'm a purist. Red wine, no chill. Uh, oh come but, on, man. Yeah, I, not I, even on a Pinot Noir. No judgment, no judgment. It's just the way I like. <laughs> it. Yeah, room town. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how much of the game did you make? Uh, we made oh, what was it? about 600 cases. It's our number one, one number one production the, out of the wine. And the price point. Twenty-four dollars. Handsome label, by the way. Thank you. I yeah. Like you know what? It again. That kind of started selling wine before we even before we even knew it. People were coming in because of the logo and the label. Our signs out on the road, and um, yeah, my 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 branding girl. She did a great job. What does Gamay have to do to get some respect in the valley? You know what? It's getting there. Um, a, we need to make more of it. There's probably oh, geez, I would. I'm not sure, but. Half dozen, yeah. six to eight maybe total out of the valley, um, and it's kind of in Pinot Noir shadow as a lot of wines are these days. A lot of great Pinots coming out of the valley, but people just education. They need to know what it is. Did you think about maybe a rosé spin-off of this? So I did. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, we half of my production goes to another winery, um, so I'm kind of stuck with X amount of tons for myself. And we're making such good gamay yeah. that I didn't want to put aside any of it for rosé. Yeah. Don't forget to chill the gamay, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, Deep Roots, what's your uh, website, Will? Uh, so www.deeprootswinery.com. Will Hardman, you go find them on the Naramata bench, my friends. 
and try the Chardonnay and try the Gamay and then go looking for other stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Yeah, appreciate it. This is Tasty Room Radio on Roundhouse Radio, 983 Vancouver. I'm Terry David Mulligan. You can find the rundown for this show at tastingroomradio.com and on the website, roundhouseradio.com. Look on the weekend show and look on the Tasting Room Radio. Working our way up and down the Naramata bench. Some of them have been above the road, some have been below the road. We come to Upper Bench, see, the Upper Bench Winery is not on that road. They're on their own damn road. It's called Upper Bench Winery and Creamery. Shannon and Gavin Miller, uh, and we've been talking to them for a number of years now. Um, how about you and Victoria? How about you and the island? Do you, have you developed a relationship with restaurants and buyers over here? We have, actually, yeah. We've been on the island now since 2012. Um, and, I, yeah, apart from the fact we love the island, uh, and our daughter goes to school on the island, um, yeah, we've got, we've, we're, yeah, Cafe Brio, we're in... Um, uh, Brio's a good room to be in. Yeah, Brio's an awesome room to be in. Uh, we're also down in the uh, in the Laurel Point, Oak Bay Marina. Um, yeah, we, we do quite well on the island. We're restaurant focused. The wines are restaurant focused as well. And which of the wines do they like here? Are they looking for white or red from you? I sell both here. Um, probably a little more white this time of year. You brought the Pinot Noir. Yes. And you brought the uh, Chardonnay. Tell me about the Chardonnay. The Chardonnay. Um, Chardonnay is something I, I kind of. Uh, invented or, or made the <laughs> recipe for well it all started when i worked at painted rock um i uh, i had to make white wine there and the only only white wine they had or the only white grapes they had was chardonnay i was never a fan of chardonnay um so i had to make something i liked uh so what what we did was we number one we put only half of it into into brand new french oak and that's what that's exactly what i do with this half of it goes into brand new french oak surly for three months yep. that, that keeps it really fresh and of course the oak's really clean because it's brand new quite a lot of flavor from the oak but because it's only in there for three months it's you know, it tampers it the tempers it down and the rest bit. goes in tanks rest stays in stainless again though we do stir the leaves even in the, in the stainless tanks to give it that creaminess that richness um and other thing that's a little bit different from a lot of chardonnays i don't put it through ml at all Malolactic fermentation, so that secondary fermentation telling green apple acid into, uh, into lactic or butter acid. doesn't go through there. I like my Chardonnay to make me salivate or to make whoever drinks it salivate. So I like to keep that, that, that acid. Who do you make the Chardonnay for? Because I know that you get a lot of conversation, a lot of remarks coming over the tasting room counter at Upper Bench. So are they telling you, are the customers no. telling you what they like? No, no, my, my wife probably hates me for this. No, <laughs> I make wine I like, and they, if they like it, they buy it. If they don't, they don't That's buy the only it. way to go? Absolutely. I have to make something I believe in. And, um, and how many cases did you make? Uh, Chardonnay of, of this vintage, uh, 400. The one we're just going to be released now, we're nearly up to 500. Price point? Uh, all in, $25, taxes and everything. All right, and now we come to the Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir again. Um, I'm a Bordeaux maker. My my history, Pop, Pop de Grove, Painted Rock. I was I've been making I've been making big Merlots, Cabernet Francs, Cabernet Sauvignon. So when I took over this vineyard, Pinot was a little bit of an anomaly. But I don't like weak, insipid wine, and I do find I do find a lot of Pinots on that lighter side. So what I wanted to make was that there was a Pinot with um, I hate to say it, more balls, more um, more structure. Uh, it's it's a it's a, a bigger use of the grape, but so I, I let the grapes ripen more. The particular varietal I have has quite thick skin, so I get quite a bit of extra extraction from it. Uh, we're with Upper Bench Road Winery and Creamery. Shanna and Gavin Miller. Shanna's I'm sure over at the table. Um, she won't talk to you for the rest of the day. Um, hold on a second. Um, did I ask you what? Uh, we're pouring the Chardonnay from 2015, the Pinot Noir from 2014. Now, if you were a cheese person. What would what uh, cheese would you put with that Chardonnay? Well, with the Chardonnay, uh, my wife does a, a, a mild washed rind uh, called Upper Bench Gold. Just just superb with this, really is. Okay. Um, and, and what would you pair the Pinot Noir? And the Pinot Noir again, because we have to be one of my wife's cheeses, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, she makes a cheese called Grey Baby, which is uh, which is actually named after her cat. It's a it's a very mild, uh, silky um, blue cheese. 
blue on the outside. A bit like Cambazola, if you like. Um, that goes superbly with this peanut. And how are things in the creamery? I don't go in the creamery much. But I mean, how are they doing? Are they oh, all the success? creamery. Oh, both both the wine and the cheese have been really successful in the last few years. And Upper Bench as a as a as a destination. How many wineries on that road now? There's got to be nearly forty on that road now. But we're number one. We're the first one. Well, as you did mention, we're not quite on the road even, are we? We're just on the road before the road. <laughs> Upper Bench like, Road is right at like, the beginning. You're like the appetizer. Right. <laughs> you're the opener. Uh, yeah, okay, we can go with that. Or the finisher, if you come in the, the other way. Oh, the other way. Uh, any surprises underneath the table? Anything you're pouring? That are good? The only thing I've got here, which I oh, it's a, it's a bit new, is a, a Pinot Blanc, which I just added just 4% Muscat to, just to give it a really nice lift. It's actually one of the driest wines I've ever made, but it tastes sweet. It's incredible. How about the food program? At Upper Bench? Well, we've got the cheese, haven't we? We've got some surprises in store coming this, this year, which I can't quite t tell you about at the moment, but um, the patio will be a little bit different this year. You want to go find these people. You really do. Upper Bench Winery and Creamery, Shannon and Gavin Miller. We've been pouring the uh, Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir. And find your cheeses and then pair them and see what you think. This is Tasty Room Radio. Now I'm at a bench wine pour. Spring releases in Victoria. Tasty Room Radio. Awesome. She's a winemaker, she's the general manager, she does it all. She doesn't make the pizza, but that's okay. And I noticed that uh, you wanted to talk about the white Merlot and the Blanc de Blanc. Mm -hmm. So white, I had to look up white Merlot because I'm thinking, white Merlot, white Merlot, hold on a second, how, does, how the hell does that work? Because it's a red wine. Oh, that was a crazy story. Yeah, I had some Merlot and we had a very cool year last year. I don't know if you remember, but it was very cold. And I had this one block of Merlot that I didn't think was going to make it for Merlot regular table wine. And so I picked it early and I was my plan was to do rosé with it, crush it whole cluster. It came out white, like colorless, absolutely colorless. It's a bit of a long story, but then I had a block of Pinot Gris that came in and our forklift broke down and we were loading the press with it by hand and it bled a lot of color into the Pinot Gris, so it was very pink. And I blended 10% of this pink Pinot Gris in with the Merlot. So it was an accident? It was an accident, uh, but I'm very happy with it. So I think it's going to live in our portfolio now. So white Merlot, because the white Merlot was literally white. So we know that Merlot is, is red, of course, but if you crush it and it's it's white when it first white. started. White, yeah. Like no skin contact, so it comes out clear. Did you try it then? Did you think maybe I'll just hold on to this as is? Yeah, because as soon as the juice came out, it tasted beautiful. Like the, the juice itself tasted beautiful. It just didn't have any phenolic ripeness. How tough will it be to sell people on a white Merlot? Uh, I don't know. I think you better taste it. I, I don't. I, Could my, you? <laughs> you better try it and tell me what you think. But you're not going to call me. it a blush, are you? No, it's not a blush. It's a white Merlot. Could it be, could, actually, could you relabel it a rosé? Because uh, it is the color of Provence. It is a color of Provence. It could be a rosé, but it's the funny thing is it came from a Pinot Gris, so it's not a rosé from red wine or red grapes. It's a rosé because of, of white grapes. Oh, you're onto something. Oh, no, you like it? That's that? good. So would you buy it? Yes, I would buy it, nice, but nice. I don't buy okay. one. Right here, it just it just shows up in my door. No, never mind. Um, <laughs> it's because you're a friend of the no, industry. No, 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 no. How many cases? I'm making 400 cases of that. 400 only? 400. Only 400, well, yeah. That won't see the end of August. No, it's um, a spring wine. Wow. Yeah. And uh, what's the price point? Price point is uh, $17.99. $17.99 for white Merlot. Yes. yes. Wow, I love the story too. And you can tell the story back when, when all your friends are sitting around trying the wines. Yes, that's it. Now. Uh, the other one is a Blanc de Blanc, and I know you love yes. this. Uh, tell me about this one. Oh, this, this, when I first started at Bench 1775, this was the first, one of the first wines I made. It's 100% Chardonnay, and it's a traditional method champagne. So it's been sitting in bottle for four years. I just recently disgorged it and packaged it in the final um, finished cork and cage. So, you know, it's like I feel like it's ready to drink right now. It's had a lot of lees contact, and I'm, I'm uh, really enjoying this wine. And it's just hit the market. Like it's, it's a wine club exclusive. So if you want to get access to it, you have to join the wine club. Enjoy. <laughs> if you want to get, this <laughs> yeah, wine. I know. I heard you. No, my <laughs> eyes, my eyes were not believing. Um, <laughs> my ears. Uh, uh, here's the thing. How many cases? Uh, we have 400 cases. 425 cases of this wine. And price point? It's $30. That's fine. 
So I can't quite recommend it as a patio wine. You know, I, first mm. of all, I love it. No, I would love mm. it on a patio. It would be, yeah, it's very, it'd be very nice to drink on the patio. But you could blow through a couple drink. of. You could blow through a couple of bottles, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've. Um, with Wine Club, a lot of people have been buying it for weddings or for special celebrations, but you can drink it every day. I would never want to put my parameters on somebody's uh, wine buying, but that is a fabulous bottle of wine. Oh, thank the 2012 you. Blanc de Blanc. Is it out mm -hmm. now? It's out now, yes. And how about the uh, blush? No, the White Merlot. The White Merlot is going to be in market May 1st. Okay. May 1st. Okay. Uh, are you still making Bliss and Glow? Oh, and yeah. All? all the other wines. Yeah. You know, I'm a little bit out of control because I taste something in the vineyard and I just feel like this has to become a wine. And so I've got a lot of new wines that I've added this year. Like? Uh, Malbec Nouveau, which was done in a Beaujolais style. So carbonic maceration and then alcohol fermentation. Small lots, only 50 cases. And a Semillon, a Semsove, all small lots. But yeah, it, you should come why, visit. You why see are you it. such a troublemaker? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the Pinot Gris? Uh, the Pinot, oh, Pinot Gris, still my all-time favorite. I drink that every day. A glass of wine before dinner. It's Where'd perfect. you make the rosé from? Uh, the rosé this year, Glow, same as always. It's from Malbec. So mostly Malbec, a little bit of Syrah, a little bit of Cap Franc, but it's mostly Malbec and still done in traditional style. So very happy with that. Okay. And Bench 1775 as a destination because... You, you took over a winery that couldn't attract people. They, um, I won't mention any names, but <laughs> not like you do. Tell me about you as a destination. Oh, well, I, I, I'm going to give a little bit of plug right now because American Express um, wrote an article about our patio and ranked it number four in the world for the best patio dining experience. So we just launched a restaurant there last year, and we're expanding on the food program this year. And we're very excited to have people come and hang on the patio. What kind of restaurant? It's going to be uh, fusion food, very, very fresh, uh, local ingredients, but based mostly on seafood. So you're going to see some Japanese sashimi as well as um, grilled meats, proteins, but it's all going to be local sourced. What happened? BC what? product. Oysters, what? lots of fresh oysters. Oh, ready to go. Yeah. What happened to the pizza oven? Uh, the pizza oven, we're still doing that as well, but we're expanding the program. So what happened to the pizza maker? The pizza maker found that he was just too busy, so <laughs> he's on to other things. He's on to other projects, but he's he just got way too busy. Way so, too busy to way be too busy. Dough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Are you open for biz now? Uh, May 1st, we're going to be open. Oh, we're open in the tasting room now, so you can come and visit us and try any of these wines that we've been talking about. And then May 1st, we're open in our restaurant. And how do people join that wine club? Oh, very easy. You just give us a call and really your only commitment is you're buying 12 bottles of wine a year and we give it to you at a at a great wine club member discount of 15%. So there's like no reason why you wouldn't want to join wine club. We're talking about Bench 1775. Val Tate is the winemaker and the general manager. I'm reading it off of her uh, name, oh, tag, name tag and I know that anyway. I know that anyway. <laughs> Uh, congratulations on the, the White Merlot and the Blanc de Blanc and the thank accidents you. that happened. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, the, some of the best things happen when you just like have a play and just see what evolves. Uh, one more thing, mm -hmm. if you share this with us, mm -hmm. what's the grand plan down the road for you? For me? Oh, well, my dream, I want to I want to take Bench 1775 to top three winery in Canada. That is my dream. What would you have to do in order to do that? I uh, just keep consistently making wines that people really enjoy, and and uh, right now we're really advancing our red wine program. With um, we're in, we're expanding the barrel barrel program for our red wines, so that's going to be the next evolution. It's our red wine program, especially with barrel aging and aging the wines in general. She's Val Tate, general manager and winemaker at uh, Bench 1775 on the Naramata Bench, and they are pouring in Victoria. We have one more interview to go, and it's the president the association. We'll be right back with Bob Tennant on Tasting Room Radio. Thank you. <clears throat> we are Tasting Room Radio. My name is Harry David Mulligan. He's Corey Wood. Corey's uh, shooting the video for us. It's on the website, tastingroomradio.com. And we finished this uh, visit with our friends at the Near Matter Bench Wineries Association with Terra Vista Winery, Bob Tennant. I always talk to Senka. Bob's always pouring or he's busy doing whatever. I'm pleased to actually talk to you, Bob. How are you? Doing okay, thanks, Terry. Do you have a relationship with the rock, with the island, you and uh, Senka? 
We do, yeah, in that our son lives here in Victoria now. So uh, coming to pour our wines here, we get an extra little uh, visit in for a uh, family visit. And how about uh, response to your wines on the island, the restaurants, etc.? Um, you know, we make really food-type wines, and they're really geared a lot towards seafood, so the response is good here, and especially on the West Coast as well, so that's a good thing. So you brought two wines to pour, the Fandango, yes, yes. I would imagine, I, 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 that doesn't surprise me in the least, that's a combination of Alborino and Verdeo, and uh, this is what, listen, literally, this is what, after you sold the winery in the South Okanagan, yep. um, no to Bene. Um, yeah, you just you decided to do this was exactly what you talked about. Yeah, we decided that we had uh, when we had owned Black Hills, we made a wine we called Alibi. It was a Sauvignon Blanc based blend of Sauvignon Blanc Sauvignon. We kind of got into drinking more and more white wines. Sink and I myself did and food type white wines and we were really getting more into crisp acid driven racier type wines we came across El Barino. i shouldn't say we sanka really came across El Barino, and we thought wow that is an interesting grape we should check this out a little bit more so you had to do some research we did some research they grow it in the central coast in california a couple of guys in oregon growing it couple in Washington growing it. So we went down and visited them and tasted the wines and thought, this is incredible, uh, grape and really a food type grape. And we thought, you know what, we should try to get over to Spain, where it comes from in the northwest corner of Spain and, and, and actually see what they're doing there and check it out there. It was a year after we'd sold our last winery, we finally got to go away instead of in January, but at a different time of the year. Checked it out and uh, came back and thought, okay, we got to find some of those vines and we're going to plant five acres and um, make some wine that we're interested in. Um, unfortunately, uh, the um, nurseries in Spain, Agriculture Canada won't allow any of them to send their vines into Canada for disease issues. So we ended up uh, bringing in vines from California, where they have certified um, plant stock in the nurseries there. And uh, we started to plant our vineyard in the um, Naramata Bench. Um, Kind of up high in the narrow amount of venture, in a long really slope, rock slope, exactly. And if you're a farmer like I am, <laughs> you'll know that it's a, really a bitch to farm. It's not Do you exactly farm top to bottom or bottom to top? Uh, both ways, down and back, down and back. And, tell me, uh, tell me about, about the response yeah. to Fandango when it came up. The response was, first of all, it was a bit of an education for a lot of people because many people didn't know of the variety of Albarino. But the wine geeks and the wine restaurant people um, were going nuts over it because it is such a sort of palate stimulating wine. We originally thought, oh yeah, seafoods and whatnot, but charcuterie, sliced meat, sausage, the acid in the wine cleans the oils in your mouth and uh, it's a great um, combo. So, did, you, did you ever see it as a patio wine? You know what? We wanted to make wines that were um, a lot of people had a lot of fun with our wine from the Black Hills. And it was, you know, a serious wine, but we were making wine for people to have fun with and have a good experience with. So is the answer yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this guy is, uh, let me pour you a taste. Yes, please, if you would. And uh, he's Bob Tennant. It's Bob and Senka Tennant of Terra Vista Winery on the Naramata Bench. We're pouring Fandango. Two, winery, two uh, varietals that you, you wanna, have, may have only heard of or haven't tasted together, Albarino and Verdejo. Uh, 70% Albarino, yeah, 30% Verdejo. It's Fandango. How many cases? Uh, about uh, 550 cases. Price point? 
And the price point of this wine uh, retail in the stores twenty four ninety. And the second one you brought over was the Viognier, which yes. is which is part of your blending program. Yes. But there it is, single varietal. Yes, and this wine is actually the fruit for this wine is from a vineyard in the Similkameen Valley. This is um, uh, sort of richer, rounder wine as Viognier is. Let me pour you a little piece. And um, this year we were kind of honored in the um, National Wine Awards of Canada. Two Viennese got a gold medal, and this was one of them, so it was a good thing. And of the four wines we sent in, we got ended up with three gold medals. So it was a they nice liked thing. you. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, they're food type wines, really. And um, this guy. Uh, Really, we make this. It is a uh, we make a Rhone blend, a blend of Roussan, Viognier, and Marsan. When we put that blend together, do blending trials. We the Viognier is the kind of wild card that we're playing with because it can quite easily overpower the uh, blend. But what we don't use in the blend, we bottle by itself as Viognier. And the first year we made it, it was kind of funny. Um, we were going to use all the Viognier, and Sanka began saying that this isn't the way we want it. This isn't this isn't happening the way it should. We should back some Viognier out. In the end, we backed out 600 liters, <laughs> and we decided, okay, well, what are we going to do with this Viognier? And so we decided we're going to bottle it as 100. So don't, if I get addicted to this, if I get hung up on this, yep. I, will I find it next year? You yes, you will. We decided, okay, the Viognier is the ingredient we're going to play with. Let's always make more than we know we're going to need. And we will only sell it out the door of the winery. And the reason we do that is we price this wine. You know, our wines are $24, $25, and we know that's a young person a special occasion wine. Instead of them going home, visiting our winery and going home with their business card, we thought we should have a wine at a price point that they can go home with our wine. This guy, um, we sell it at $19, all taxes in and bottle deposit and everything out the door. And um, great value. And um, I can go home with it. Okay, Bob Dennett, I have one more question. Um, yeah. And that is Figaro, which yes. is Roussan and Viognier. Viognier. Yes. How's it doing? It's doing well. The, we, we actually are referring to Figaro as a winter white. <laughs> the reason we're Why? doing it, because it pairs, it's a richer, rounder, mouthfeel wine, pairs with um, uh, poultry, pork, root fit, Thanksgiving type food. So, it, you know, a little more winter fare. It would be your winter patio wine. There it is. There you go. Yes. Okay. Uh, Bob Tennant, uh, who is, uh, of course, a uh, co owner and partner with uh, Senka Tennant, uh, a chair of Mr. Winery on the Naramata Bench. We're talking about Fandango and the Viognier. Now, you are a director of the Naramata Bench, so it falls I on am. you, Bob yes. Tennant, to talk about all things Naramata Bench. Uh, what's is it, what does the year look like? What are some of the events that are coming? We have a pretty exciting, there's 28 wineries in our association now, Terry, and a pretty together group. And I got to say, since we moved there eight, seven, eight years ago now, uh, it's been a great, um, we've been welcomed in and a great sense of camaraderie amongst the wineries there. As after this event here in Victoria, April 28th, we're at the Four Seasons in Vancouver for our Wine for Waves event. Right? And we partner that event with the um, OceanWise group from the Vancouver Aquarium. That's with Ned Bell. Yep, Chef Ned Bell, wonderful guy. And um, uh, we um, have done this for the last four years. This is the fourth year actually with them. And really we have raised over a hundred thousand uh, dollars in as a putting on this event. Took money going to the, the ocean wise program in the aquarium. Tell me about Roll Out the Barrels. Roll Out the Barrel is a free event on the bench. Uh, 
not all wineries, but various wineries, pop open the barrel. You can stop into their winery. They bring out their thief and will draw some wine out of the barrel for you. You can taste some wine before bottling and get a kind of buzz on for that wine. And, and what's the date on that? And roll out the barrel uh, is Saturday, May the 13th. And that's, that's say, part of the wine festival, right? Yep, part yeah. of the wine festival. Great event. And, and then the tailgate party. And the tailgate party, kind of a legendary party in the um, in the Naramata area, September 9th this year. It's been uh, held at the Angelo State Winery. They've got a beautiful field there overlooking the lake, and uh, all the wineries pull in their pickup trucks and put down their tailgates. And it's and, uh, always sold out. Always, I'm telling you now. If it's not sold out now, buy a ticket and figure out how to get there. Yep. Go to our website is the best thing, narramattabench.com, and the events are on there. The tailgate, live music, coupled with um, restaurants uh, serving their food there, and uh, wonderful um, party. Okay, uh, by the way, while we've been talking, another winery has joined the association. It's now 29. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, it's 29. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, yeah. Bob Tennant. Uh, nice. Speaking on behalf of the Narramatta Bench Wineries Association, and of course, the Viognier, the Fandango, Senka, and everybody in the room today. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this has been Tasting Room Radio in Victoria. Better yet, rather than discover Narramatta Bench in Vancouver or Victoria, wherever you happen to live, go there. Drive the road. Take your time. Have a ball. It's fantastic. Above Penticton, it's a gorgeous place. Thank you. You bet. Thanks a lot, Terry. This is Tasting Room Radio, Victoria. On behalf of myself and Corey Wood, Take care of yourself. Have a great weekend.